Hello, I'm Nick Jimenez, and this is the Cigar Snob Podcast at 2018's Puro Sabor Festival in Esteli, Nicaragua. Carlito Fuente of Arturo Fuente Cigars dropped a bomb of an announcement. The Fuente family, known for its Dominican-made cigars, let the cat out of the bag about its plans to open a cigar factory in Esteli. The Fuentes don't do anything halfway, which means that this one company is going to change the landscape of Nicaraguan cigars, and cigars broadly. What's more, Carlito announced that the person running the Fuentes Nicaraguan operations from seed to cigar would be Felix Mesa. There's a chance you've heard the name. Felix is the owner of El Galán Cigars, which has a small factory in Esteli, as well as a retail store near the cigar snob offices. So he's our uh, neighborhood tobacconist, as well as a maker of cigars that have landed on our top 25 list. Felix isn't a household name in the cigar world, so when people learned that the guy at the helm of what's sure to be a massive operation would be a relative unknown, it generated even more questions. On a recent trip to the Dominican Republic, I had a chance to sit with Carlito Fuente and get deeper into the story. So why Nicaragua? Why now? Why Felix Mesa? And what should smokers expect to see coming out of this expansion and into their humidors? So this interview is the first time that Carlito has gone into this level of detail with any cigar media. Uh, With that, here's my interview with Carlito Fuente. I think to somebody who hasn't had the opportunity to talk to you about it or to hear you speak about it, the obvious question is why? So what's, what's motivating the decision to open a factory in Nicaragua at this time? The past. If you don't recognize and honor the fact, the past, it's impossible for you to foresee the future. Uh, Nicaragua has always, uh, it was part of my life. We, I lived there from 1973 to 78. I was there on and off between Tampa, Nicaragua with my father and um, have a lot of special memories. Imagine you're, you're a young boy, you leave everything behind in the United States, and you, you go to a place that, that was almost like a frontier land. Um, I remember walking down the sidewalks. They were made out of, they were wood, wood, old wood sidewalks. The roads were dirt roads and, and um, I remember, I'm just thinking, I'm trying to, to go back in, in time of that when I was just a young boy in my very early 20s, maybe. And it was a challenge for me to be there and to prove to my father how much I loved him and that I was going to support him. A time when um, all of my friends were going into the computer business or becoming real estate brokers and being very successful and propers going into Wall Street, everyone I went to school with. I wanted to prove to my father and my grandfather how much they meant to me and so forth. I chose to go to Nicaragua and to help my father in any way. But basically, the reason my father allowed me to go to Nicaragua because he knew that, that at that time during the 70s, is where all the greatest masters have congregated. I'm talking about not manufacturers alone, the greatest men of Mother Earth, of the soil, of deep tradition, that come back from our heritage, that understand tobacco, who live, breathe, and sleep tobacco, uh, gave me an opportunity. It was like, it's the greatest university that I ever attended. Why Nicaragua? Because it's part of my life. And uh, we were there, and we were young, ambitious, who wanted to build something. It was a time when in Tampa, Florida, uh, remember our company started back in 1912. We're over 100 years old now. But at one time, my grandfather, everything was completely made by hand in all Havana tobacco. But after the embargo, the cigar makers' children no longer want to learn how to make the cigars like everything happens in life. Oh, a lot of things happen. Uh, people who make things by hand uh, now depend on computers or machinery and so forth. Same thing happens with cigar making. And the great cigar makers, their children were now entrepreneurs. They were professionals. They were, they were uh, different walks of life, but making cigars was not a thing of the future for them. And the writing was on the wall. 
And my father one day asked me, sitting in a restaurant called Spanish Park on 7th Avenue in Ybor City, where all the great cigar makers of Tampa used to gather and have lunch. And I want to just, in parenthesis, a little anecdote was that uh, we used to go there to speak private conversations and talk strategy, but we used to go there so we could talk. But imagine, we used to sit on a table and two feet away was another cigar maker and two feet behind was another cigar maker. And every cigar maker, every, all the great cigar makers of that old past were there and everybody was talking quietly because, shh, don't talk because, hey, do you hear what he said? Everybody was trying to pick up information and try to keep information from others. It was that kind of world that I grew up in. And um, the writing was on the wall, as my father said. And one day he came to me and he said, um, cigar makers were already in their 70s. They were older. They were all Cuban or Spaniards that had been making cigars for generations in Tampa. We're making A5As, Selection Privada, number one, Churchill's, Casadores de Lux, and, and several cigars that were all made by hand. But there were only about 40 cigar makers. And I remember Tampa, which is, has great weather, also has very cold weather. And whenever... Uh, the weather dropped below 60 degrees, half of the workforce wouldn't show up because they were people already with arthritis, old, and so forth. And long story short, my father says, what is you? I said, handmade cigars is our heritage, is what we want. And we were making a lot of machine-made cigars in Tampa to be able to support the factory and so forth. And we had an opportunity in Nicaragua. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but one of the greatest supporters of our family business who was always there for us and uh, are still there for us is the Ange Oliva family. And this, there's so many things I could say, and someday I, I hope to write a book, but to say the truth, because I don't think there's any greater force in life and for the future generation is to recognize and respect the blood, sweat, and tears of the past. Ange Oliva understood that my father would make handmade cigars. Before that, my father had gone to Puerto Rico. He had gone to Jamaica. And he, we were making cigars in Mexico uh, with Jorge Ortiz. I knew Jorge Ortiz, what a fine gentleman and, and so forth. And my father used to buy tobacco, San Andres wrappers, which was an incredible wrapper from Jorge Ortiz, his father called Fodino. His name was Fodino Ortiz. My father used to tell me stories. I used to go to Mexico, open every bale. He used to get there. You know how the how, how they are. Well, my father used to tell me, never seen people like this in your life, in this life. He said, I used to get there. He picked me up in the airport. And I want to see tobacco. I need to work and get out. I want to see every bale. He said, because I had to check every bale. Porque no sé como estos mexicanos siempre. A la larga me jodía. Me tía. Yo miraba la paca, lo llevaba la aduana. There was always something in the middle that they're the best. He said, but they pick you up at the airport. And, Papa, and I want to see tobacco, but no, no. First, you have to go to their hacienda. The mariachis, the, the, the beautiful horses riding, the beautiful women. The food is endless. You got to first have a festival. But all these stories and everything about my father, he tried handmade cigars in Mexico, Jamaica, Puerto Rico. And we were not successful. We had a, he had a lot of problems. And... Cigar makers were, it was becoming very difficult. Naje Oliva took us to Nicaragua. They opened the doors. They introduced us to Juan Francisco Bermejo and Fernando Funticier and his wife, Aurora. They were the original founders of Joya de Nicaragua in the 60s. They were partners with, uh, well, it was Juan Francisco Bermejo who grew all the tobacco, who the Oliva family took to Central America because the Oliva family was one of the families that really set up all these in the very beginning. They were the pioneer. Juan Francisco Bermejo was one of the partners. He was in charge of growing all the tobacco. He is the, he is the founder along with, he was the tobacco man. Fernando Fonticella was the cigar maker. He was the one that ran the factories. Simon Camacho was another partner who was the one at sales in the United States. And all the sales of Hoya Nicaragua went through Oppenheimer, which Simon Camacho was the factory partner that went through Oppenheimer. And back in the 60s, the end of the 60s, maybe 
uh, beginning of the 70s, that was the number one selling cigar in the United States. Uh, and that it was, it was a great cigar, great packaging. It was beautifully made cigars. And the part, their partner was Anastasio Somoza, was their partner. It got to uh, the reasons why, I don't know, but eventually Anastasio Somoza bought all his partners out. So Oliva told uh, my father, there's a factory there who are, that is making cigars. They're great cigar makers. They've got a great reputation, the best tobacco, but they have a lot of cigars. I want you to go see them. My father said, no, I want to do my own factory. No, go see the people. I remember going with my father that first trip. We went, we met Fernando Fonticier for the first time. Juan Francisco Bermejo. If you meet Juan Francisco Bermejo, you think it's like Clark Gable, a Cuban Clark Gable, the big bigote mustache, impeccable sky blue guayabera, you know, white pants, and the thick black hair back. And you say, what a charming man. No, this man would, he could sell flashlight to a blind man. But anyway, we meet all these people, this and that. We see the cigars. My father really didn't have interest, but I was younger with ambition and dad, yeah, but the cigars look good. He goes, yeah, they look good, but I don't believe in doing anything with other people because we already have experience with your grandfather, blah, 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 this and that, and we have to do things ourselves. But my father, he says, they, they had a big inventory that was unsold because they didn't have access to the United States because their partner, was, the one that had the access was Simon Camacho. In the past, he was no longer around. I don't remember what happened to him, if he already had passed or whatever it is. Because I do remember Simon, another very elegant gentleman and everything. I know Simon very well. He had brands like Monte Carlo. And uh, with Monte Carlo, I remember we established Don Carlos in Nicaragua in 1976. And not to have a conflict with uh, Simon Camacho, because it's very close to my father. Simon sent him a letter, there would never be a conflict and so forth, and we came out with Don Carlos. But anyway, uh, going back, uh, my father brought back samples, this and that, the cigars were good, gave it a few people, and they went crazy. So my father said, well, no, I don't have the capital and everything really to start a factory. And Mr. Oliva convinced my father, look, this is the perfect combination, just like it happened in Nicaragua. You have the tobacco farmer, Bemejo, you have the cigar manufacturer, Fonticilla, and you, Carlos, who have some contact. We didn't have nothing back then, but to Oliva, he, you know, Mr. Oliva had a great vision. He built families. He built, he helped people and he guided them. He was, to me, he was like, you know, he was the godfather, like a godfather to me, a mentor. And he says, you start with sales. And we started buying cigars. We shipped some cigars handmade, this and that, under their brands. People went crazy with cigars. Then they called my father back to, you know, they wanted to sell more and everything. And they told my father, look, this is a perfect combination. I want you to have one third, go third, third, and third. And we went there, and I think they were making about 3,000 cigars a day. And with several, after several years, I remember in the end, we were making 18,000 cigars a day, expanding, building, and everything. And I used to stay there. I remember, and I'm saying because I just returned from Nicaragua, that I remember Nicaragua, is, uh, I, I remember the good times and the difficult times. Difficult, why? Because... I left everything behind in Tampa. I, I left the, uh, you know, the Tampa lifestyle, the luxuries, uh, being a Tampa boy, grandson of Arturo Fuente and everything. You know, we had, it was difficult. And moving to Nicaragua, I spent a lot of time with, which to me was a little difficult, and I didn't realize it back then, but I spent time with the greatest tobacco masters that ever existed on this earth. They were all there, all the great men. I spent a lot of time in Jalapa with all the, the different Cubano farmers, and I would sleep with them. I was with Miguel Guerra, who was at Povenid. I was with Angel Gomez, which was La Esperanza. And, and I don't know if people have met Danilo Moncada, who was the heart and soul Chateau de Fuente for 20 years or more, who just passed. Danilo Moncada, I remember him as being the foreman or, or the Farm, the general manager of all farming at Esperanza. That's how we met. He worked for the Oliva family. And Aje Gomez was the head administrator of the old Cubano, who was one of the greatest rapper growers. I mean, the, all these old school, uh, eh, Maquito Padro. I mean, it goes on and on, Daniel Rodriguez. I mean, it's, it's on and on. These were great masters. And Nicaragua, for me, I was like a blank slate of a computer, a brand new computer with no information. I was able to go there and 
I was able to be with the, the greatest masters because I was not a threat to anyone. I was the only one of my generation, the only one. There was no one else in this world of my generation that was even interested in the cigar business. Everybody was doing something else because they, they saw the writing in the wall. There was no future in the cigar business. It was a dying business. I was the only one for maybe 20 years. So being this young boy from Tampa, a son of a chinchalero, which he was considered, uh, from, it was not a threat. So I had such a passion. I asked about Cuba. I knew so much about Cuba. I talked about Benny More. I talked about uh, Trio Mat I wanted to hear all this stuff. Uh, 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 Duo Isaguerri, you know. And they started talking to me, and I started opening the door with these old men. And I was a little boy. And they got a real liking to me. And they talked to me about Cuba and stories and how tobacco. I had no idea that all, these inf all this information, these were going to be my professors. Like when you go through life and school and experiences, at one, at, the moment comes when all this information clicks together and it becomes the software of your thinking. In Nicaragua, to me, I remember, um, I remember that... I wouldn't call my parents. These are little things, anecdotes, but I wouldn't call my parents because I didn't want them to worry because there was no communication. There were dirt roads. Uh, the sidewalks were wood, like I said. And the only thing that I was allowed to do was go from the house to the movie theaters on Sunday. And I went with someone that you probably all know that used to go with me. He was like my big brother, Alberto Calderon. Beto Calderon, as you all know, and many know, he... He's Angel Oliva's nephew. A lot of people don't know that because he worked his last many, many years with the Paris family. But the Paris family, the me too, Silvio Pérez was there. I remember visiting him. And, you know, all these old timers. He bet Oliva used to live two uh, doors down. I remember the only thing I was allowed to do was go to the movie theater. And then we used to go every night to a Chico hotel because that's where everybody used to gather, play dominoes. And that's where I was starstruck with this with this man that that spoke with so much authority with so much confidence and and constantly and he was in the limelight and everything and that's Jose Orlando Padron I became very close to him also as a little boy I remember all the stories and everything but there were only a handful of people back then Nicaragua was part of my life in May of 1978 uh, we lost the factory we lost the hope it wasn't really the revolution yet, but it was the beginning of protests and everything. And, and every factory was burned down that same day. Padron's factory, uh, René Garcia Pulido's factory, uh, Galindo, I think was the name of their brand, Garlindo, if I'm not mistaken. But you're talking about, what, 45, 50, you know, something years ago in Orlando Padron's factory. And the only factory that was not burned because it was completely surrounded by, by the National Guard was, was Somoza's factory. I don't really remember any other factories back then. Almost everybody there, and they were dozens and dozens and dozens, were tobacco families. Uh, one, of the, one of the only ones still living, and I joked around the other day, I said, man, I remember he was younger than me. What the hell happened is... Uh, is Nestor, Nestor Placencia. I remember going to Nestor's house. He was a young guy. I think he was just married. He had a birthday party or something in a little house there. And I remember Nestor, you know, and the memories and some of the, you know, just as part of my life. Situate, I'm going to say something that might be very hard to swallow for a lot of people, but it's the absolute reality. Once here in the Dominican Republic, where I'm sitting now in my office, you ever see uh, when those programs on TV, when you have a group of cameras that just come into the front door and they want to, this is your life and so forth, blah, 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 and you're caught by surprise. I was getting ready to leave and I see a cars come up, cameras coming out, this and that, and I see the, the head editor-in-chief, whatever you call it, of Listín Diario. That is the most prestigious newspaper of the Dominican Republic. Someone who have the highest respect for like it, it's like a New York Times or Miami, but this man in this country, which is uh, a small country, relatively speaking, this is the most prestigious and the head authority as far as journalism. And he comes in and I'm like, what's going on? He goes, we want to ask you a few questions. And I couldn't believe it. And I was leaving and I, and I said, 
I mean, I'm, he says, just okay, but just, I said, no, come in because of the person that it was and the respect I have for him. And I remember they came into his office, all the camera, this and that, and they're asking questions spontaneously. And they said, why are you here? Why are you here? And I said, you know, it's ironic because in life, when you look, everything is the yin and the yang, the positive and negative and all that. Me being here has been great for us. And hopefully we contribute something to the country, but it's been in the detriment to somebody. What do you mean? Explain to me. Why are you here? I said, por el maldito mismo diablo. He said, what? ¿Qué es eso? I said, we're here porque el hijo puta Fidel Castro. If it wasn't Fidel Castro, people won't know where Cancun is. They won't know where Punta Cana is. They won't know where all the, I really, and the guys looked at me. I said, it's the truth. Because you know what? Why did we go to Nicaragua? Porque Fidel Castro. Why is Nicaragua? And why Santo Mimi? Because you know what? We would all have been in Cuba. We would have been in Tampa. Tampa was the greatest cigar and everything. We had Cuban tobacco and everything, but it changed our lives. And because of este cabrón, everybody else around the group, there wouldn't have been no Las Vegas like there is now. They wouldn't have been this. And they stayed quiet. But if life is strange, I mean, Dominican Republic, because of the situation of politics, and it's ironic to think, uh, why am I Nicaragua? Because Nicaragua was my home once. My father, for a long time during the last six, seven, eight years of his life, when we were at a point that I don't want to say that we were comfortable because we never gave up, but we were just trying to keep the ship and make the best cigars humanly possible, and we had no intention of any change or anything like that. But my father always, I mean, constantly had me crazy. Oye, Carlito, if I was 20 years younger, I don't need that, 10 years younger, I go back to Nicaragua. 10, I don't want, if I, I don't want to go because that's where we were first and everything. And I don't like to go without finishing something that I started. If I was, and that used to bother me. I was like, oh, no, man, I, you know, I, I, how am I going to go back to Nicaragua? I'm, I'm already getting old. I'm tired. We got so much here. Man, we got our hands full. We don't need to go back. And my father, me sembró esa, esa pidura. If I were younger, I'd be in Nicaragua. And he used to tell me that, but he didn't ask me to go. But um, it, that's how, I think that's motivated things. But I think that um, I'm in Nicaragua because I think that God speaks to you in many different ways. You have to learn how to listen. It could be you're going down a highway in the middle of nowhere. I mean, in the middle of nowhere, where there's desert for miles and miles and miles on both sides, and you can't see anything from one horizon to the other, other than sand. And all of a sudden, you see a three-legged little puppy crossing the street in front of you, and you say, what the hell's happening? You got to stop and listen. Or it could be in the middle of a desert and a butterfly rustling around your ear. And all these little things to me, my father, when he, his illness and all these things he spoke to me about and just the colleagues, the memories and everything, something just got, came to me and say, said to me, it's time. Because we have always been Nicaragua, even though we've been very quiet about it, we don't want to talk about it, we're very quiet We've had farms in Nicaragua. We've had uh, farms farmed for us in Nicaragua. Always. We never really left Nicaragua. And um, it, time just came. There's another generation coming up. I'm never going to abandon the Dominican Republic or the people of the Dominican Republic. All the contrary. Everything I'm doing is to strengthen my relationship and my commitment to the Dominican Republic. But I also think that from my experience in the Dominican Republic, I know that this might sound, uh, you know, it might too much and I'm really getting deep, but this is what I feel. And this is what I want to express. This is really what burns inside of me from what I've seen that could be done in the Dominican Republic. And I'm referring to not the factory alone, but how, how cigars could bring people together, how cigars could bring people's thoughts and bring good synergy and goodwill together and what has been accomplished with Cigar Family Terrible Foundation, how you could change the world one shot at a time. Cigars just 
shouldn't have boundaries. The enjoyment of a cigar shouldn't have boundaries. C- cigars and tobacco historically has been known to, for its magic that it melts any barriers. That is the bridge that connects people from different walks of life, from different political positions, from different ethical backgrounds, from different religions, from different genders. Cigars bring people together, which goes back to the discovery of America. Because when the Europeans went searching to find treasures and spices and whatever they were looking for, benefits, shortcuts, whatever it is, they landed here in the Caribbean and they were looking for gold and spices. They found it, but they found it in in the form of tobacco. Tobacco is something that is native to the Caribbean and America. Tobacco is something that's so complete. It's almost like, you know, it's a trilogy. Tobacco was used by the Native American. This goes back so deep into mankind. Tobacco was used not only for social reasons to gather people together and, and to for, for whatever social experience was necessary and so forth. Tobacco was used also for medicine. I mean, you go back in all the books that was used for medicine. Even my grandfather, when I used to cut myself, don't tell your grandmother, don't tell your grandmother. He used to get a piece of tobacco and go get kerosene because our house was heated with kerosene, the old house of city. So I won't get pasmado. You know, you won't get, and that was the whole thing. And believe me, it, it works. And I've done many things with tobacco. That's the way tobacco was medicine. But what people don't understand, and they're not aware of, the most important, important aspect of tobacco was not social and it was not medicine. Those who really understand tobacco, tobacco is spiritual. Tobacco was used throughout America and so still today is part of our spiritual belief. It's religious. And people shouldn't fuck around with religion. Everybody has a right to have their own religion. And so tobacco is tobacco shouldn't have boundaries. Uh, I shouldn't be isolated here. We've accomplished so much, and we're going to continue to work very hard. But I think that with the world of cigars and people who love cigars, I think that Nicaragua is is something that is very, very important to be able to spread the love, improve. Like I've said many times, if you talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. I have an opportunity in Nicaragua. I have so many colleagues, dear friends in Nicaragua. Uh, things have changed. This world has become very small in our world of cigar making. There's only a handful of real cigar makers left. Some are here, some are in Nicaragua. We got to unite. We got to take care of our neighborhood. Our neighborhood now is not a satellite city on the other side of the planet. We all one little village, even though we're a plane right away. It's one little village. We have to protect each other, nourish each other, and the Dominican Republic, the Fuente companies, and the Fuente positions here will nourish Nicaragua. And I know that Nicaragua, the talent in Nicaragua, uh, the resources of Nicaragua will also nourish our company here and vice versa. I've always said people compare us to winemakers, but it's much different making cigars than making wines. There are thousands and thousands of winemakers, and I love wine. There are thousands and thousands of winemakers all over the world. You grow grapes. I know it's not that easy, but I'm just trying to simplify things for people to understand. You grow grapes, you squeeze the juice, you ferment it, and then you mix it together. You're mixing liquids, and you put it away. It's all uniform. When you make cigars, you're blending solids. You're blending herbs and spices. You're blending, you're blending oregano with parsley, with garlic, with a little bit of olive oil, a little piece of butter. This is what gives you all the dimensions. And it all comes from the soil. That's natural. And that's why I always consider ourselves, we're chefs. We're not, we're, it's a little different. It's more like chef blending solid. And if you're a great chef, you want to have the best resources in the world. And in the Dominican Republic, for example, you have the best and you have the worst. You have a whole spectrum of different tastes depending on the climate. Even in our own farm, we have at least eight or different, eight or nine 
different characteristics depending on the high land, low land, low, near the river, near the mountain. It changes. And I've heard this since I was a little boy. In Cuba, tenemos el mejor tabaco del mundo. También está el más malo del mundo. That was my grandfather. Cuba grows the best tobacco in the world, but it also grows the worst. Before, when he said this, there was no Dominican Republic. There was no Nicaragua. There was no Honduras. There weren't other alternatives. But that just goes to show you what tobacco is. And as a chef, and one that wants to have herbs and spices, Nicaragua is going to be a great resource for us in the future to have more dimensions, more colors, so that when I stroke that canvas with different colors and paint, I could, I could create something that's much more complex, much more beautiful, and continue to, to be able to put my heart and soul what I want other people to enjoy. All right, so there are going to be other questions. You, there was a lot there. Uh, I do want to talk about one person in particular, which I think has a connection to a lot of the things that you said about um, you know, this is a person who, like you, is part of a younger generation now, like you were. Mm -hmm. He's part of a younger generation mm -hmm. in Nicaragua. Uh, he's, he's got the chef thing going on, although I guess in this case it'd mm -hmm. be maybe something like a sous chef. Mm -hmm. um, but Felix Mesa, who uh, my understanding is that, you know, his, his name came as a bit of a surprise to a lot of people when he was named as the person who would be in Nicaragua uh, as the dude at the factory. Tell me about how that relationship comes about and what the process was like of getting to the point where you decide to bring him in in this role and also give people a sense of what that role will be. Like everything in, that's happened in my life, nothing is really planned. You might have visions and hope, but it's not planned. Remember when I spoke earlier, I said that I had no interest, no intention. There were missing links to the chain for me to be able to complete a destination. I have memories in Nicaragua and all these different things, but there was something missing that didn't exist. It didn't exist in anywhere I could imagine, even though I would have looked. I've always said it's not about cigars, it's about people. People and the love for people and respect and integrity is really the strength of any organization or family or my home, which is this, the factory, the farm and everything. I met Felix Mesa four or five years ago, which is not that long of a time, but I was introduced to Felix Mesa by Manny Diate. I'm the kind of guy that tries to avoid meeting anyone or, or you know, this and that, especially if they're associated with, with making cigars or in the cigar industry. I tried to stay away and be, be my own self, and Manny spoke so, to, so much to me about Felix. I got to meet Felix. I got to meet Felix. That he met this guy that he reminded Manny so much of my father. He's been in tobacco. He knows tobacco. He's a tobacco man. But he's got so, such a passion for cigars, and he's just such a down-to-earth guy. He doesn't mingle with other people. He's just focused on working, works on the clock, and I got to meet this guy because this guy is like one of us. Anyway, I got to meet him, you know, and met several times talking. This It had nothing to do with cigars, had nothing to do with where we're at today. And the guy was just a nice guy and everything, and we started building a friendship. And this is like everything else, like most people who are around me in my life today. It's not planned. It happens, but it's organic. It starts growing and growing. And I talked to Manny, I mean, not Manny, I'm sorry, to Felix, and we just used to get together, enjoy. He never, he always asked me for my cigar and said what a great cigar we had. Uh, he was always, you know. Yeah, he's not trying to push his No, never, never, and, never, yeah. never anything. Never asked me for anything all these years. Never, never, and never, hey, listen, do you have a bill of tobacco or you have this I could buy from you? Or never, never, all the contrary. Always promoting, always friend. He, she, he, I started seeing this man that was so humble, how much he respected my friendship, and we just became friends. We became really good friends. This relationship just started growing and so forth, and we started eventually talking tobacco. I was very surprised that I could talk to someone about tobacco, spoke the same language, that I was taught by these old masters 
who grew the best tobacco in the world for generations from Cuba, who were in Nicaragua and everything. He spoke the same language about fermentation, about seeds, about tobacco selection, about this and that. Felix is a multi-generational tobacco grower from a campo de Cuba. This is, he was born with, I mean, this, he was born into this from his grandmother, his parents. And he started talking to me during this time about he wanted to do this or he was doing this, working on a label because he wanted to pay tribute to his grandmother, who his grandmother was his life, Doña Nieves. And he wanted to pay, and all these things I'm thinking about, wow, what similarities, how I always want to pay tribute to my grandfather. Today, my father, whatever. This is, and we have so and many. Even when, when you hear him talk about it, he. No, no, no. It's no, not, no. It's not he only marketing. About it. No, no, it's yeah. not marketing. It's not marketing. It, yeah. It's born from within. And his inspiration is from love from within and the admiration and wanting to do the right thing. Yeah. And those kind of things started bringing me closer, closer and talking to him about this and that. And then uh, over years, seeing him, seeing how he does, seeing him in different places, over years, I started observing more and more. So I Manny was always saying, oh, yeah, you need good people around you. This man is, is a humble, hardworking, down-to-earth, man's man, good father, good man, good friend. It's too good to be true. This, and, you know, and he's small. And, it, and we just started getting close. And we started getting close. And, and um, it, you know, then the, I, I had, uh, a, we had purchased a farm. And uh, Felix was was there, and and he just and many Felix has been a good friend, supporter, helping me doing things for years. And it's not that I was trying them out; it was just that we just became really like as good friends as you could become. That's when uh, I told my father about Felix, about this man, Felix, Papa, un campesino, guajiro, tobacco man, tobacco in his blood, and I wanted him to meet him because my father was my life. Everything I wanted, my father said, you know. I want you to meet Felix, he's a good guy, he's dad. They, oh, before that, uh, I had spoken to Rich Dolak. Rich Dolak is my right hand in many ways. Like other right hands I have, I'm very blessed because it's not me. I got great people around me. And Rich Dolak was in Nicaragua all the time because they have a company there, uh, Penza. So I said, Rich, Rich, I want you to go say hello to Felix. And he's a great guy, whatever. And Rich went to see, and Rich came back, Orlando Maravilla, speaking marvelous things. Oh, yeah, you got to go to see this factory one day. Felix reminds me of the stories of your father when I was a little buckeye. I used to sleep on a bale of tobacco so he could get up early in the morning, this and that, the same thing over. And he said, you got to see this factory. It's small, but it's beautiful. And he lives right inside the factory. The whole, you got to go see this guy's good. This guy's good. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, that's Rich. And my father was like, this was Rich. They were together all the time. They bought him up. My father was Rich's teacher for 20 years. Rich was about my father. Rich spoke to my father about Felix. I said, you want to meet him? You have to meet him. It's okay. So they met several times, said hello. So my father liked him. And one day I said, Felix, come to Tampa. Come to my father's house. I want you to talk to my father. And they used to go outside, you know, talk about tobacco with my father. Uh, smoke. Don Carlos never smoked. He, Felix never bought a cigar. He would smoke Don Carlos with my father, this and that. And uh, my father started building a relationship with, with him. And then my father started to say, this is a great man. Because that was the most important thing to me, the acceptance of my father. And that's how the relationship started. If it wasn't for Felix Mesa, if it wasn't for Manny Iriante to introduce me to Felix Mesa and keep on telling me, because I was so busy and had so many other problems, my mind was everywhere, I would have never considered doing this because there's no one else in this world that exists that I really feel would be in that position that I think would take care of it as well as my father would have if my father were in Nicaragua, or me and I think we're in order together. I have all the faith in the world, Felix Mesa. I think that he's going to become one of the superstars in the future. He's much younger than me. He's hardworking, comes from a good family. He is, um, you know, he's, he's one of the main reasons, or he's the only reason, along others, of course, there's never only one, that I'm, that I'm going to Nicaragua. And Felix is going to be uh, the director of all our operations in Nicaragua, everything. Not only, uh, not only the factory, but tobacco and fermentation. And listen, we have, we have a bucket list of things we have planned to achieve in a tobacco world. It's not going to be just cigar making. Right. Uh, he's the perfect man. Yeah. So that's what gives you the energy, gives you enthusiasm, the confidence. 
that what we're going to do is going to be good for people who enjoy cigars. So he's going to be running things day to day at Bella La Bestia. La Bella La Bestia, yes. So, uh, which translates to Beauty and the Beast. No, not really. To some people in May, but that's not... Well, I mean literally, like the phrase from English to, from Spanish to English. But tell me... Let me ask you a question. How do you, how do you translate uh, Carlos Fuente? I guess that doesn't have a translation. Oh, it does. Right, yeah, Charles, Charles, Charles Fountains. Charles Fountain. Charles Fountain. But if, if somebody says, Char- Mr. Charles sure. Fountain, I would never turn around because okay. it's different. La Bella La Bestia. It, yeah, so why the name? No, La Bella La Bestia because my father was involved in this whole process as, you know, uh, giving his blessings, giving the support. He never, he didn't see the final, but he knew and he was an encouragement and so forth and he was an approval. The most terrifying thought in my life is a little boy. I'm not talking about little boy. Since I was a little boy, when I realized that in life you're born and you die, was that someday I may lose my father. That was, since a little boy, the most terrifying thing in my life that I just never thought that day, I didn't want to see a day come. And um, our father's everything to me. I've always said that it's my, my dreams, my wish to follow his footsteps because I understand I could never fill his shoes. And the day came. And I had to find a way to pretend or to appear that I was strong because I had my sister and we have gone through so much in the family just prior to that. I just lost my mom uh, less than a year before and, you know, and family members young and and so many people. It it was, it was very difficult time for me. I didn't know how I was going to get up, but I know I couldn't show people how down I was. I mean, down when I didn't really then it was difficult to get out of bed. I went through a very tough time. We went through it, but I had to keep going, had to keep going, had to keep going. Thank God for people around me, good people who gave me support, who never gave up on me. People from all over, and even some colleagues who people may consider competitors, told me, Carlito Fuente, and if he hears this interview, you know he is, one day, Carlito Fuente, let me tell you something. You're too good, and you got too much responsibility. You better sacudite and get your shit together, because we need you. People might consider a competitor, I, I consider him an extension of my family, I took balls. Somebody much younger than me, but stood up to me, and you know what, that kind of shook me up, and I said, I gotta move forward. And the day came when all of a sudden, what was very dark, it was almost like uh, sunrise became very bright. I lost my father, and I realized one second, it's, just, it's strange how things happen, that he's my biggest support in life. I walk through the factory and I see something and I hear my father's voice of 35 years earlier saying, someday this situation is gonna happen. This is what I would do if it happens to me, talking to me every day, every single day. And everything started, I started feeling more confident, more encouraged, more enthused and everything. We're going to Nicaragua. We bought this property, the property of uh, where the Bella and La Bestia is being built. We've had that fa- that property for two and a half, almost three years. People don't know about this because I kept very quiet because my father became ill and so forth. And that I, w- I didn't want people until I was ready to do something. I wasn't sure what the future was going to be. Felix Mesa is the key to this, to having someone like him who's taking care of that property. Felix Mesa bought the property. He bought the property with Manny. They went down there, he found the property, bought the property, cleaned the property, did everything, been taking, nursing the property in all sense. He's grown three crops on the property. We haven't used one leaf. There's gonna be a box of cigars from tobacco from that farm and the, the wood is the wood for the cigar box that was from that farm. Why the name La Bella La Bestia? Not the, it has nothing to do with the beauty of beast. I realized in life, the reality of life, what is life? This is the physics of life. It really is, it's the physics, it's what it is, this is life. It's the yin, the yin, the, the, what do you call it? The, the, the yin and the yang, like I said earlier. The leaving of my father, the passing of my father, and I realized that in life you have to face the beast. That was my greatest terror of life, that would terrorize, have to face the beast in order to accomplish and see the beauty. That's the way I thought in English. And I said, man, you know, when I'm thinking about all these things, man, going to, 
Eh, coño, tuve que enfrentar el animal, coño, lo más pesado en la vida. Eh, esto que tuve, esta pesa, esto, coño, lo vi, pero mira ahora lo que... Now I'm free to do all the things that my father looking down on me to bring up smiles that he feels that, that I feel. Maybe I'm doing this for me in a selfish way that my father, he could be looking down, smiling, and feeling proud of me because there's nothing more I want. Not only my father, my grandfather, everybody do the right thing. And that's where the name comes from. La Bella, La Bestia is facing the beast to be able to accomplish the beautiful things in life. Right. So last question, and this one answer as briefly or, or not as, as you want. But, you know, from a cigar smoker perspective, which is who, who we speak to uh, and who listens to this, the one thing that, that is also burning in their minds is, well, what do we expect as cigar smokers? What, what is coming down the pike? What does this mean for the cigar landscape? How is my neighborhood humidor going to change? What, what's happening now uh, as, as a smoker? So well, what what might you? I know it's very early. There's not even a fact. No, no. It's, of course, it's early. Right. Yeah, it's what's early. You, what's your vision for oh, on my, the product side? To the I'm not. I'm not going to rest to accomplish this. Okay, this is not. Yeah. A, it's not. It's only a, my my vision of the future is, is my accumulation of the past. I don't intend to go to Nicaragua unless I could do. I go. I'll do everything I did in the past. I don't intend to because it's a big risk for me. We see what we have here to begin with. We're chefs, like I said again. We have all the resources, tobacco, five, six, eight, you're all the different tobaccos and everything. I'm not going to, I don't intend to go to Nicaragua to interfere with anybody else or be a conflict to any other of my colleagues there. I'm there to support the country. I'm there to build something that is born from within me out of creativity Uh, not to play a jukebox and play songs that someone else has already played, to go there as a John Lennon or Paul McCartney and create my own songs. Do something different. Do something at the time. We have the, we have the resources, tobacco. The techniques that I will take there will be different. Uh, the blends will be different than I do here and different than anybody else does. It will be different, but it will be fuente. It's not going to be Nicaraguan. It's not going to be Dominican. It's going to be Fuente. The cigars that we make in the Dominican Republic are not Cuban. They're not Dominican. They're Fuente. When I go to Nicaragua, they're not going to be Cuban. They're not going to be Dominican. They're not going to be Nicaragua. They're going to be Fuente. Fuente with Mesa. With whatever we do and everybody who works on our team, we have a big organization. I've always said again, and right now is the most important thing to me, to really emphasize this. It's not about cigars, it's about the people. I make cigars like some musician or artist creates songs. I create songs and cigars that are born from my heart. But I would not be pleased or satisfied if that song that I create does not bring smiles to other people's heart. And the cigars I create are not something that's going to bring pleasure to people all around the world. My goal is to make people happy. And hopefully... I don't disappoint anybody. Yeah, I mean, that all sounds like things for everybody to look forward to. So It's a for, big challenge that I'm yeah. putting myself on my age, huh? I better not let anybody down because, you know what, I would be very <laughs> hurt and disappointed. I don't intend to, and I will give my heart and soul to deliver 150%. Well, I know a lot of people are excited about whatever it is that's coming down the pike. So thank you very much for the time, and uh, we'll all be waiting anxiously to, to see what happens. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Cigar Snob. What an honor, a real privilege to be no, able no. to chat with you. Thank you Same. very much. Thank you. All right, so there's a lot there, but then this is a big story, and we are all just at the tip of the iceberg on what this means. I, for one, am looking forward to seeing what it means for Fuente, for Esteli, for Nicaragua, and for the whole cigar world at large. As always, thank you for listening to the Cigar Snob Podcast. Make sure that you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, or SoundCloud, or you can do all three if you're a crazy person. Rate and review us while you're there. You can also find full episodes of the podcast at cigarsnobmag.com slash podcast. Share this episode with friends and fellow smokers who you think might be interested in the story. If you're a social media person, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Cigar Snob Mag or search Facebook for Cigar Snob Magazine. Finally, 
Make sure to send any feedback, questions, or comments that you might have to feedback at cigarsnobmag.com. We might just respond to you here on the podcast or in the pages of Cigar Snob Magazine. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Nick Jimenez, and this is the Cigar Snob Podcast. Cigar Snob Magazine.